How often should we partake in the Lord's Supper? And what does it mean when we do? Jesus said, this is the New Testament in my blood. What did he mean by New Testament? I want to know. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of the Doctrine of Christ with myself and Brother Jimmy Cooper. And this week, we're going to be doing another lesson on the Lord's Supper. This is a topic that has so much depth to it that even two lessons or or even three is not going to exhaust it. And I want to preface our study this evening with a comment by Thomas Watson, and Mr. Watson had this to say about the celebration of the Lord's Supper. It is a visible sermon wherein Christ crucified is set before us, or it is a sacrament of the New Testament wherein by receiving the holy sacraments of bread and wine, our communion with Christ is signified and sealed up to us. And that's what we have when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's a sermon in action. And when all of the symbolism and the meaning of this is really understood by us, when we take the Lord's Supper, it's going to be a reminder and a constant uh, lesson to us of all these deep truths of God. So it's like a parable. You know, it's like in the prophets, they said, you know, take the stick and hit it on the ground. And uh, it's something we act out like Ezekiel, you know, when he built a model of the city of Jerusalem and laid on his side, you know, we're acting out a sermon. And this is a very good way to think of our celebration of the Lord's Supper. And, um, and it's a prophetic parable, parable too, as we'll see as we discuss some of the other aspects. And the more I think about it, the more I wonder if we're even going to be able to exhaust um, the depth with this, but we'll just see. Um, In Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, likewise also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. The cup represents the New Testament. Testament. Now, last week, we uh, used the term bread and cup, bread and cup, the simplicity of it. Well, the New Testament in my blood represents two concepts, testament and covenant, testament and covenant. And these are two aspects of the meaning of the New Testament in his blood, which we want to explore. And we, uh, well, well, let's just get a little help from Uh, Thomas Manton, and he'll help us to bring it into focus. Testament and covenant. These are two concepts that we want to stick with our students. Thomas Manton said, this is on page 475 of volume 15 of his works. He says, a testament is a man's last will about the disposing of those goods which he leaveth at his death. So is the covenant of grace, a free and firm disposition of the mediator's good things to be possessed by the heirs of promise according to his will. A covenant, it is with respect to the manner of agreement, a testament with respect to the manner of confirming it by the tester's death. And a study of that that Greek word, would bring out both those aspects of meaning. And we want to explore this because both are tremendously important. And a testament is just like Mr. Manton said, like you or I would make a will, we would leave our worldly goods to our children. Well, this is what's going on here. When Christ died, we are his children. And through his death, we receive the blessings of the atonement, and we will receive an inheritance in the new Jerusalem. This is just an amazing concept. And here 
in this symbolic action of the New Testament in his blood, in the cup, this is, first of all, we'll try to understand a little bit about just what it means to be an heir and a joint heir with Christ. And in the book of Hebrews, which is dead center, as is all of Scripture on the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testor. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the tester liveth. So we're talking about something that came into existence with the death of Christ, whereby all that come to the Father come through the New Testament, the New Covenant, which is symbolized in the cup the New Testament in his blood. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, and when we partake of it, we understand and should have in our minds that as the children of God and as the Israel of God, we are receiving the blessings. We are receiving all the covenant blessings which Christ bestows upon the Israel of God. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We are a joint heir with Christ. He is receiving the kingdom from the Father. We receive it as a joint heir with him. An amazing thing. And notice the qualification. Here's the two aspects. We have testament and covenant. And here in the last part of verse 17, there's a qualification. It says, if so be that we suffer with him. If we obey him and if we follow in his words, then we're a joint heir. Testament covenant. In uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29 Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is where we plug in to the Israel of God. All of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant will be fulfilled when Christ returns and we have the new Jerusalem. We are joint heirs with him. And this is very much something that should be in our minds when we take the Lord's Supper, it's a testament. Mm -hmm. He is leaving his inheritance to his children, which is us. And it is through the covenant that we make with him that will give us a right to the inheritance and all of our ministry. This is focusing. Everything in our ministry is focused right here. It's spot on in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. This is where we are. We are ministers of the New Covenant, pointing people to the death of Christ upon the cross, the gospel, the doctrine of Christ, and in this acted out sermon, as Brother Watson put it, we are portraying all of this to people. So these are the two concepts we want to think about, testament and covenant. So we understand testament. Testament is the bequeathing of the kingdom and the blessings of the kingdom to the join heirs that are there through faith in Christ. But let's think about the covenant aspect. And we saw that a little bit in the implication there in Romans 8, 17, in the last part of the verse, if we suffer, well, we'll be a join heir. Now on page 478, this is what brother Manton said. He said, only I must give you this caution that all things required of us as conditions and duties are also disposed as legacies in the covenant. Jeremiah 24, 7, I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people 
and I will be their God. So Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. This is the proper intent of a testament that certain unspeakable gifts are designed unto us antecedently to all conditions being performed by us. There's a condition to receiving. It's a covenant. And in a covenant, there's two parties. God for sure is going to do his part and we must do ours. And just like Brother Manton said, let's read that again. This is the proper intent of a testament that certain unspeakable gifts are designed unto us antecedently to all conditions performed by us. He requireth them, he says, not only privileges, but qualifications. He requireth them so we may be sensible of our obligation and acknowledge our duty so as to strive to do our uttermost in the use of means and turn these precepts into prayers. So we come to the table understanding Testament covenant. And as we come and partake and we think of all the many blessings, that's the way our human nature is. We want to think of the blessings, don't we? And yeah. we don't want to think about the obligations. When we preach about, oh, we'll receive all this, and it is great, it's marvelous beyond comprehension. It's all great, but then, oh, we are in a covenant, we must obey. Now, that's when a lot of people in the mass of evangelical Christianity checks out right here. Well, and I just looked up, I went back to that Romans 8, 17 verse about where he said suffer, mm -hmm. suffer with. So I just looked that up, and uh, it's the Greek 4841 in Strong's. And it means to suffer or feel pain together. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to, we just want the gain without the pain, don't we? Yeah. To suffer evils, troubles, or persecutions in the like manner with another. Where's this with this prosperity, pimps? Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and as good Americans, it's hard for the average church person to believe how much he is inundated and brainwashed with this type of thinking that um, has produced a lukewarm is okay um, American Christianity where uh, suffering is a sin to the prosperity movement and all of these things, all of this craziness. Mm -hmm. And we've got away, and of course we've talked about the once saved, always saved DOC. And this idea that once I say the Lord's prayer, go down the aisle, that that's it. It's good. You know, but there's a covenant, you see, in the word of God, there's a covenant and to obtain the blessings and to receive the inheritance, there must be obedience. And the uh, a scripture in Hebrews, I think, helps to qualify this. And this is what we're all about. We're calling people to obedience to the doctrine of Christ, to really coming back to follow Jesus once again. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 28 and 29, uh, it does away with this idea. You know, we read the, the Old Testament. We understand that uh, you break the Sabbath, you're going to die. You know, you despise the Sabbath and willfully break it. You're going to die. And uh, there were other capital offenses. Well, somehow, uh, and of course, now Israel is not in the land. The Israel of God is in dispersion. We don't rule with uh, here in Evansville and in Indiana with civil government to decree who gets put to death or who lives. But nonetheless, under the new covenant, those obligations of the covenant to receive the testament are just as real. And this text in Hebrews brings this home very clearly. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy 
under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. So instead of being less severe, it's even more severe now to trod underfoot the Son of God and willfully disobey him. And this brings back the tremendous importance of that which we're doing, bringing people back to the doctrine of Christ, not being ashamed of his words, but expressing our love to him and the Father by obeying his words of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant. That's what we just talked about in that cup. This is the New Testament in my blood. It's the blood of the covenant and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. We have to remember when we come to that holy table, there's testament and covenant. And that's all implicit right within that one word. And it's all implicit in all that Christ did there. And if we would just remember that thing, simple truth, testament, covenant, we would be focused on obedience. And uh, it's something that uh, when the doctrine of Christ is rightly understood and we truly come back to being his disciples, uh, this will be clearly upon our minds at all time. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will shew you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not, he is like a man without a foundation, built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So it's testament and covenant. And when we understand that correctly, we are on the way to building upon the rock. So this is all a part there in this acted out sermon. Now, uh, another one of the frequently asked questions regarding the Lord's Supper is how often can I do it? You know, is there, uh, you got to do it once a quarter, whatever. And the answer to that is there is no specific requirement of how often. But the more I study this and the importance of it, the more I know that we need to be doing it more. And yeah, I mean, I, I bet just me, if I take communion more than six times a year, I'd be shocked at this point. And I'm starting to feel like it should maybe be a, an every Sabbath kind of thing for me to start doing because I've been reading, um, Brother Watson, one of he has he has like two different teachings on or uh, books or writings or something I don't know because they're all inside of one thing that I have over here. But uh, it's on it's on the Lord's Supper and the, the all the things and and the steps and and how sacred it is and how much we need to to come dressed for the feast and it's a feast it's a it's communion. It's it's uh, joining with Christ. It's and he, and he would he warned everyone to really look inside yourself and deal with um, you know commune with your own soul for a bit before you come to that table and you make sure that you know you you've gotten yourself cleaned up you know and and you're not holding forgiveness and your unforgiveness and you know you've you're not holding on to any unrepented sins. And just, I mean, the list goes on and on. So I'm thinking, man, if I started doing this every Sabbath and I followed these guidelines, 
that seems very beneficial to me as far as me keeping my head and my heart lined up with the Word of God and denying my flesh and and keeping my thumb down on it and not letting it get any kind of hold in my life. And and I think if, we, if we'll do this in a proper way like that, it would benefit us all so much. Yeah. And if we have a proper understanding by studying deeply into the Lord's Supper, every time we come together, we will have an excellent sermon from the Master himself. Mm-hmm. And these most precious truths will be impressed upon our mind once again. And literally, you could talk about the Lord's Supper every service, and there is so much depth that you would never wear it out. Yeah, it, it's, it's that amazing. Uh, it, it is just that amazing and that supernatural. And, and that would be perfectly fine. Um, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. And as often, it's... uh, I've heard people talk about that they do it every day. Yeah. Like they start their day uh, with their spouse, and they'll have communion together just every day. I, I... it was uh, one of my former pastors was talking about he and his wife would get together and, and every morning and do that. And that is perfectly fine, right, and proper. Absolutely. And this is the way that Brother Watson put it. He said, as often as you eat this bread, this ordinance is not to be celebrated once in a year or only once in our lives, but often. A Christian's own necessities make him come often hither. Hmm. Our own spiritual needs will dictate that. And the more we realize how weak we are and how much we need him, the more we can run to this acted out sermon to receive the blessing right from him. And even though we are involved in offering the the bread and the cup when it's done in simplicity it all points to him and the the message and the sermon is really coming from him you know this doing remembrance of me we were remembering him remembering his death and it's so focused this is the new testament my blood is just all there and um, did any of the apostles after jesus ascended did they ever talk about how often they did it Well, good question. And in Acts, the second chapter, we have a glimpse into the early church. Acts 2.46, it says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And in the earliest apostolic church, It was a daily thing, taking communion. And with the taking of communion, the agape love feast was associated with that. And the getting together and eating the meal together and celebrating the Lord's communion. You know, this was the heart of New Testament worship. They didn't have the big buildings, and that's why they'd done so well. They didn't have the light show and all that stuff? No, they didn't even have a PA system. How did they How they make it, you know? Wow. And it was, it was about him. It was about love. How did, they, how did they keep their attention, you know, span? How, how did they keep them all, you know, interested? Yeah, and it's silly. And... They would eat together. They would celebrate the Lord's Supper. They would pray for one another. And this is what I tell people when they are in these obviously corrupt churches. Come out just like you're beginning to do. Come out, worship in your home, get together with friends. doesn't have to be elaborate. You know, take the Lord's Supper. Worship. Open your Bible. Read it. Pray for one another and allow for the gifts of the Spirit to flow, you know, and it it comes together. 
Yeah. We don't need all of that. We just think we do. And if we would get rid of all of that and do this, that's when you're going to have believers that are going to be strong. Yeah. Believers that are going to be strong. Oh, yeah. That reminds now, me of uh, being Acts 2. Uh, you ever remember that band, second chapter of Acts? Oh, yeah. Oh, Ma- I, sure I think do. Matthew Ward was a singer. Yeah. Man, oh, yeah. they were good. I tell you what, they sounded like angels. And um, it was, you know, back in the early 70s, we'd never heard anything like that. Still nothing quite like that. But, oh, yeah. Well, and I got a feeling that uh, they probably named themselves that because that's probably – I got a feeling they all got together, their whole group of people got together daily or often in each other's homes. And I mean, that's probably why they called their, their group that, you know? Yeah. And those were back in the days of what they called the Jesus movement. Yeah. And, uh, they were a part of that back in the early seventies and Larry Norman, who I had the privilege of knowing and even Petra, they come along in the late seventies. I think my yeah. early Petra album I have, I think nineteen seventy seven. Yeah, and that was in the pre John Schlitt days in Petra. Yeah, that was with Greg. Um, there was also bands like um, Res Band. They were a well, we we call them communes now. I mean, these guys they would have a group of believers and they would all live in the same area and they would work together for the common good of everybody and. Um, another group I think's name was Servant. They they kind of mm. did the same thing, and and uh, but they all got classified as uh, that's kind of kooky now. You know, you can't do you can't really do this Acts two thing anymore without being considered a little crazy. And back then, there was the Vietnam War, mm-hmm. which was obviously history has shown us that was a big mistake and a big mess. Sure. But a lot of the right-wing churches were pumping that, and that was tied. You see, this is the danger of hitching the gospel to a political agenda. When the political agenda proves to be wrong, it's a reproach upon the gospel. And as this was perceived by many, there was just like we're in our time, there's a parallel. People were disgusted with the churches because of, obvious problems. And we're in the same period now. And just like they would come out and they, they didn't always do everything right in all kinds of different groups, but they knew that was wrong. So they come out to try to do something different. Well, we're in the same position now with rank apostasy. We see the problems. And once again, we see the gospel being tied to political agendas. So once again, we have Many people that are being called out of Babylon, but now with the understanding of the doctrine of Christ and following him and the return to the simplicity of New Testament worship, we can have a sure guide to where we won't repeat some of the mistakes that were made back in the, in the Jesus movement. They had a lot of things, right? Yeah. Had a lot of things, right? A lot of a lot of real good come out of that and a lot of strong believers. So um, hopefully this go round we'll be able to um, even improve. Well, you know, the, yeah. one of my clients who is becoming, you know, a dear friend and a, a brother, I mean, I'm sitting there when I go to his dealership and I'm taking photos of all the cars, he's usually there with me. Uh, because we're talking the whole time and we're talking about God and, Mm. and we're just talking about these kind of things. And one day he said something that was so, uh, I'm like, wow, that was profound, I guess is the word to me. It was profound. We were talking about this kind of very same thing. And he goes, we took an organism and turned it into an organization. Yeah. And I'm like, that really stuck with me. Because that's what's happened. It, it, this organism, this living organism of Acts chapter two, and and that whole first uh, church, you know, got turned into an organization, and it's been one for two thousand years almost. 
and it's been turned into an industry yeah, and a business. And that was never meant to be. Never. That was never meant to be. It was supposed and to be the opposite. Come. And now we could, this would segue right into the 501c3 issue. And, um, you probably got that, a message on FOJC about that, I imagine. Yeah. And we did a midnight ride on, it was called the house, no, the church on Haunting Hill was what it was called. And we talked about the 501c3 in depth, which, um, it was just never meant to be, you know, the only head of the church of the living God is Jesus Christ. Amen. No government, no man. He is the head. And whenever we put something else in headship over the body of Christ, which the 501 C three does, we have cut ourselves off from the head. So this is a huge, there's so many of these things that, There's so much leaven has come in, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about repenting, coming back to Jesus Christ in the Bible, and getting rid of all of the leaven. Not 80% of it, not 90% of it, all of it. Well, a little leaven that's left will just continue to overtake again. So a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. And today the attitude is, well, a little leaven doesn't hurt a thing. (laughs) But it does. It'll it'll make the whole thing just swell up and get right. Yeah. So that's what we do. And a lot of times it's a process understanding where all the leaven's at. Just like here as we come into the Passover, you gotta search it out. You know? Yeah. You gotta search out that leaven. And that's the point of that whole uh exercise, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. You gotta search it out. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that here too in just a minute. And I, I was when I was uh, reading Stephen Sharnock um, on this text, let's read the text here in Exodus chapter 12, 30 and 31. And it says here, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. And I'll read Stephen Sharnock's comment on this. It's uh, volume 5, page 514 of his works. He says, As it secured them from death, So it was the earnest of their deliverance and broke the chains from their slavery. And when we come, just like we think, uh, we've got bread and cup, we've got Testament covenant. We also have salvation and deliverance and deliverance is something that we should think of when we come to the Lord's supper. He goes on to say the death of Christ is the foundation of, of the full deliverance of his people and the earnest of the fruition of the purchased and promised inheritance. This was the contest of Pharaoh upon which soon after followed his destruction. Pharaoh's heart was not bent till the celebration of this Passover. When we rightly understand the Passover and that which we're doing of the New Testament in his blood, we'll understand it not only as salvation, but as deliverance, full deliverance from Pharaoh. This is what will bend Pharaoh's heart. This is what will drive Pharaoh from her heart. There should be devils cast out when we observe communion properly with full understanding. That's how much power there is here. It's the New Testament in his blood. This is what will break Pharaoh's back right here and drive him from our hearts. There's so much power here. And uh, bread and cup, Testament covenant, salvation, deliverance. Well, you know, you. I was thinking about this last week, and I actually think I read it in— uh, it was it was almost like a passing by thought in 
uh, Watson reading uh, on the Lord's Supper. Is this true? He said, now this is back in the 1600s, but at that time, the Catholic Church had made a statement uh, where they were not going to, that the, the, the blood part was only going to be for the priest. The cup was only going to be for the priest and not for the people. And so they took half of the sacrament away and were just giving them the bread. I wonder if that still happens that way or if they, you know, take part in the, in the bread and the cup now. And if well, any of you guys know that watching, you know, send us an email or something, let us know. Yeah. And it was just exactly like brother Watson described at the time in Catholicism. And the truth is it has changed because popes change things and it's gone back and forth. And I actually uh, heard, I was in Florida, and I was doing a seminar, and I heard two Catholics get into an argument over whether when you take communion, if you'll go to hell, if you hold the bread in your hand. Now, some see it goes back and forth. The priest, now he's got to put it right in your mouth. Yeah. Well, then for a while, you can they can hand you it. You put it in your mouth. Then, oh, no, you'll go to hell if you do that. Well, the priest, the, the cup's for the priest only. And, and, you know, it's gone back and forth. And Brother Watson was addressing this um, absurd abuse there at that time. And, of course, they were doing transubstantiation. It was just all silly anyway. So this is why the Bible is our guide. You see, we can't go by the um, the Haggadahs or guide. We can't go by the Pope as our guide. Right here, we've got the guidebook in the Bible. And um, the, the silliness that's gone back and forth with all of the Popes changing back and forth, it's just that it's silliness. The Word of God never changes. And this blessed rite of communion has never changed since that first night that Jesus said this do. So here again, we're just having that argument. The Bible is your guidebook right here. It ain't going to change. So a lot of people were uh, robbed of that blessed communion because they were only getting half of it. Yeah. Hmm. I wonder how long they did that. Oh, it went on for a long time. Hmm. And and then, you know, uh, the next Pope takes over if he wants to change it, you know. There you go. It's just um, well, it's just so sad and it's just so silly. Do we have to use Welch's grape juice? Is that the best one? <laughs> well, no, no, it actually isn't. And on our um, and in Scripture it says fruit of the vine, and to use just grape juice is fine. That's fruit of the vine, but. We have on FOJC a teaching called Apostolic Communion, and I go into many, many quotes from the Antonicene Fathers, and they were very dogmatic that it was one part wine, two parts water. And this was the way that you would have probably took communion anywhere in that way within the first 300 years of Christianity. And I observed communion like that. And you, you uh, think that was just to water it down so you wouldn't get a little tipsy or was it uh, to make it go further? No. And there was deep symbolism in that. The water it, part. Yeah. It represented the Holy spirit mingled with the blood of Christ. And okay. They taught, oh yeah. Yeah. And they taught deep lessons on that. And according to, and in the, uh, we talked last week how the Haggadah, which is what they're using today for Jewish satyrs, didn't mm -hmm. come 170, 200 A.D. But we know from the disputes between the schools of uh, Hillel and uh, Shammai that there were disputes over the cups that were passed and uh, over what prayers to say about them and all this stuff. But. We do know that the way that the cup was mixed at the time of Christ, and this is according to um, 
Alfred Edersham, and I have him right here um, at hand. And he says this um, on page 497. He says, the cup in which, according to express rabbinic testimony, the wine had been mixed with water before it was blessed, had passed around. And this, at the time of Christ, we know that there was the cup, there was the feast. It wasn't in the tightness of the ritual uh, that come from the Haggadah, but absolutely, you know, the Jews celebrated Passover, and it, it didn't become that uh, more complicated ceremony till later. And uh, Mr. Edersham says also on page 496, he says, I have often expressed my conviction that in ancient services, there was considerable elasticity and liberty left to the individual. And it wasn't um, just a starchy ritual. It was more of a fellowship and an actual worship before uh, the rabbis instituted that after AD 70. So absolutely, that's the, the, the understanding that we have there. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's fascinating. I, I've never heard that before. Yeah. And you go to FOJC. And there's, you might there's a link. link. I put the link in the video. Okay. All right. And uh, it's and we could very well do that again. And of course, there are so many, and I don't mean this in a bad way to anyone, there are weaker brethren that are so, uh, and there are some believers, they think it would be a sin for alcohol to ever pass their lips. And there's great dangers there. I don't want to make anybody stumble. And there are so many people that have so much problems with alcoholism yeah. that when there's people there, I don't know, um, I'm probably going to use grape juice like at Passover when we have a larger crowd, but we could very well. And if I'm going to have an apostolic communion, we could very well do that. And I'll announce it ahead of time. So, um, and and make that fact known. But it is it's deeply fascinating, and the uh, the the reason why, and it's over and over brought out that all of those anti Nicene fathers they believed in doing it that way, that they were doing it the way that Christ did. But you know, ultimately, the Bible didn't say he mixed wine with water. It says he took the cup. So, you know, the Bible's our guide. So if it might've been 100% wine at that point, we don't know. We don't know. So, you know, the Bible's our guide. So fruit of the vine's okay, but it is fascinating. And that's a study that, um, I brought a lot of facts in there. So go listen to that apostolic. Yeah, I'm going to have to watch that. Yeah. And it's, um, it's kind of neat, very neat. Okay, um, let's look again. Uh, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 11, 26. It says, For often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Now, we are proclaiming every time we partake, we are preaching and proclaiming the death of Christ for our salvation and deliverance until he returns. Now, Brother Watson said this, and I like this a lot, as I like so many things. And as you said, and as you pointed out to me, I have this little booklet here. Well, it's not a booklet. It's, well, it's 86 pages long. It's not large. You can read it very quickly. To you, but that's it, a pamphlet. You well, just laid it, down that Eversham, or that book that's that thick. Oh, yeah, my goodness. <laughs> Edersham, that's a thousand pages plus of not real large print. Yeah. But. I mean, back in those days in the 1800s, they wrote books. Yeah. You know, I mean, they wrote books. Yeah. And, um, but anyway, uh, this is what he says. Oh, I love this. And uh, this is actually in the foreword of this book by the, the man that wrote the foreword. He says to Watson, the Lord's Supper was a mirror in which to behold the sufferings and death of Christ and was, in certain respects, a more excellent means of grace than the preaching of the Word. 
a mirror through which we look to behold his death. We are looking at it just, we're, we're going through the complete understanding. And let's just read some scripture to help us understand how important it is to really focus and meditate upon the death of Christ. And um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, for I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. We focus on the death. Now, a lot of people today um, really want to diminish the cross. Um, we were talking on the last midnight ride about it just drives me crazy. The Jehovah Witnesses, uh, complete Jewish Bible, the scriptures, Hebrew root translation, they want to take out the cross, stake, torture stake, just drives me crazy. And the focus upon the cross is something we have to have. You see, in a lot of people today, they want to talk about the resurrection life. You know, they say the cross, and this is big, Hagen, uh, in the Word of Faith movement, he said some really derogatory things about the cross because it's resurrected life. You don't want to have a sin consciousness, you see. But if we don't have the death of Christ where we die with him, we're not going to have the resurrection life. You got to go through the cross to have the resurrection life in our faith and also in our personal experience of dying with him um, that we can live with him. Thank you for watching this episode of The Doctrine of Christ. We pray it provided you with clarity and understanding. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode. Follow us on Facebook. Leave a comment. Ask a question. You can also email us comments and questions now at the Doctrine of Christ series at gmail.com. And until next time, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you all.